The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy. And he writes a comical sports column. You must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Monday afternoon here in the BS Report, another sunny day in Southern California. And a sad day because Lost ended last night. One of my favorite shows ever. We're going to dork it out today. We have uh, a TV critic, Alan Sepawa, one of our favorites. My buddy Gus, the biggest Lost fan I know. And then at the end, uh, a premier thinker. And uh, and somebody who hates when people complain about Lost, Chuck Klosterman, our old buddy. So if you're going to fast forward to anybody, go 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, because that's what we're going to try to do. Right now on the Subway Fresh Take Hotline. Now on hitfix.com, right? That's correct. Alan Sepawa. How are you? You stayed up late last night to write your, your review. I stayed up very late. Yeah, I'm talking to you on about three hours of sleep, so I, I think I'll be speaking English, but I can't say for sure. So you didn't just say, I'm going to go to bed now and wake up at four and crank this out? Because that's what I do now, and, and it's actually been better for me than staying up late. Um, I just would lost. It becomes one of those things where it's so much on my brain that like I can't go to sleep, so I may as well just get it all out while I can. And then you know, today i got 10 million other things to do. So. I have a I have a confession. I went to bed last night and I was thinking about the sideways um, purgatory universe and the current universe and all the time thing. And I was like half asleep, and it actually hurt my brain. I thought I was gonna. I thought I was having some <laughs> sort of. I'm not like you always hear like, oh, I thought I was having aneurysm. Like the right side of my brain actually started to hurt, and it was like telling me just stop, stop thinking about this, just go to bed. You're gonna hurt your brain. You're gonna break it. And yeah, I, I, bed. I think you get to that ending, and they're basically telling you don't think too much about it. Everybody comes together. They go into the light. Yay. Right. So, so let, let's solve this once and for all, just because there does seem to be a little bit of confusion. To me, there's no confusion. I read your your uh, your post, your late night, had some coffee at midnight, and, uh, and cranked something out post. We both agree that uh, what we saw during the six seasons on the island all happened. The sideways universe – was purgatory, correct? Yeah, or something like purgatory. You know, yes. I, I, I'm not that up on my theology anymore. But the, the island definitely happened. Jack lands. Jack wakes up. Jack does all these things. Jack dies, and then at various points in their lives, all the other characters die, whether on the island or much later. And they all wind up in this sort of weird afterlife waiting room until they're all there and can get together in the church. So the purgatory, the two biggest signs were that the church had no religious – it had basically had every religion. It yes. didn't exclude religions. Correct. In the lost world, every religion is in some way right. And then the other big sign, which is when – that's when I realized it was going to be what it was, was when Locke, who climbs out of his wheelchair, tells Ben, are you coming in? Oh, no, Hurley. Hurley tells Ben, are you going to come in? And Ben says, no, I'm going to stay here. So obviously he has some more repenting to do. Yeah, he, ben did more bad things than pretty much all the others combined. So I imagine he's still got a little repenting to do and or he just wants to hang out with his daughter some more. Stuck in purgatory, poor Ben. Yep. <laughs> now, Ben had probably the most interesting journey of all the characters because – you know, he at some points he's evil, then he's not. Then near the end, it looked like he was going evil again, but it, obviously it was trying to elaborately play the smoke monster. And then finally settles. He always looking for his role in the island, and then finally finds it as Hurley's number two, as his conciliary. Yeah, which which I think is a good use of Ben. He always wanted to be Jacob's conciliary, but Jacob wouldn't give him the time of day. So finally, he gets to work for somebody who says he gives him a few attaboys. Uh, I was yeah. a little disappointed. I was I was expecting more of Ben in the finale than we got, and I was like you was sort of expecting Ben to be playing the smoke monster in some way, and it just seemed like he was sort of wandering around, didn't know what to do until finally at the end he you know teams up with Hurley. Well, he did miraculously get the tree off him, but we never saw how. Yeah, that was that was impressive, and he was <laughs> he was moving around pretty well for a guy who had a giant tree trunk fall on his midsection. 
And then they, as they set it up, it was like, oh no, Ben's, oh, they're not getting him out. So even Sawyer says, cause I rerun, I think Sawyer yeah. was the one who says, I can't move it. And it's like, oh, poor Ben, he's going to die under this tree. Then anyway, he's on the cliff, he's fine. Yeah, well, you know, maybe Hurley's stronger than we think. We, we see him throw Charlie over his shoulder in the sideways at one point. You know, right. he, he could have been working out. You don't know. So, Ben, I, I was satisfied with it. Jack, I thought his character and the decisions he made in the season finale and how his arc ended, I thought was the truest for how they were able to keep it together over the six seasons. You know, his, a, a lot of the backstories with him were about his need to fix things and make everything right. And, and then eventually that's what his destiny became on the island. You were happy with how Jack played out, correct? Yeah, I was. Cause you know, I was like one of the, the most public Jack haters there was on the internet. And I, I had some really contentious you know discussions with the creators of the show over the years about my hatred of Jack. Uh, and by the end, I came to like him again. I, I think a lot of it sort of takes guts to make your hero be that big a jerk for that long. Also, that at the end, when he sort of gets his head together and does the right thing, it, it has a lot more weight than if he'd just been sort of the good guy all along. So I, I applaud that. And then, you know, there was always this big, this big picture battle between Locke and Jack. Yeah. Locke believed in the power of the island. Jack did not. And then there was a little bit of a role reversal, which I liked. Yeah, because the guy who looks like Locke no longer believes in it. And there's that really great moment where Jack tells Smokey, you know, I really, you know, John Locke was right about everything, and I really wish I could have told him. Right. So even though they killed off Locke last year, he still sort of gets a little valedictory there. Were you okay with Hurley ending up being the gatekeeper of the uh, of the island? I thought that was the perfect choice. Hurley was always sort of the, the fan stand-in. And so the idea that basically the fans are, are the keepers of the flame or the magic log flume or whatever you want to call the light uh, at the center of the island, I thought that was a nice touch. And, and he's always been sort of... The, the hero of the show, as far as I'm concerned, because he's the one who asks the right questions and, and sort of looks out for people and isn't caught up in his own stuff as much. So I, I thought that was great. Kate, probably they did the worst job of all the characters with her in season six. Agree or disagree? Uh, I don't know if Kate was the worst. Uh, I mean, certainly her, her her episode wasn't very good, but I think Sa- Saeed was kind of all over the place and they never really explained that. I thought they lost the thread on Jin and Son. Uh, but yeah, Kate was sort of out there. I, I liked the idea that she came back to the island to get Claire and you know bring her son's mother back to him. But they kind of lost the thread. And then in the end, I liked the fact that she was the one who got to kill Smokey because you know she started out the show as this really tough girl you know who could fight and shoot and all that, and then they moved away from that. So it was good to return there. I thought they betrayed the love triangle because if she really loved Jack, she stays. Instead, she goes back to take care of Claire's bastard baby with Claire. <laughs> but she, you know, as we saw on the sideways, it, it wasn't her love of Jack that, that reminded her. It was the, her son. She loved her son more than she loved Jack, which I thought was nice because we spend all this time on the triangle, which I never thought was all that interesting. And in the end, you know, she does. She chooses Jack, but we're reminded that really that is much less important than a lot of other things on the show, including you know, little Laren. Here's what I would, where I would have gone with that, and I think it would have been awesome. And it's also a theme that they did not touch in six years. Okay. Claire and Kate, little attraction. <laughs> they go and they go back to L.A. and they take each other's last names and hyphenate them and they raise Aaron together as two moms. Aaron has two mommies. I would totally watch that spinoff. I, I would probably watch Sawyer and Miles as cops and Locke and Ben as school teachers first, but I would be on board with that. I mean, Kate, when you think about it, Kate, that would have been a, a pretty interesting move for her. She Bad luck with men her whole life. <laughs> Can't really commit to Sawyer, Sawyer or Jack. Well, why is that? Well, maybe she doesn't love men that much. Maybe she likes Claire. Maybe Claire with a little ruffled up with a dirty face. Oh, that's kind of getting her. And then they become the two moms. I think that would have kicked ass. I would have loved that. Lost for, you know, when you think of all the modern shows that became huge phenomenons, Lost is the only one who never touched the gay thing. Well, they did briefly. What, what's his face? Tom, one of the, the others, the, guy, the big guy with the mustache, turned out to be gay, but that was... He did? Bad. I don't remember that. What year was that? Well, first there's a thing. Remember when he's when they have Kate captive and Ben wants her to change into the nice dress and Tom's in the locker room with her and she's worried he's going to peep on her. He says, Kate, you're not my type. And then there's a later scene in, I think, the episode where Michael comes back, where you see Tom in New York in, like, his apartment, and he's got a boyfriend and lots of fine art and wine and cheese and stuff. Oh, uh, I forgot about that. 
They, I, so yeah, they, it wasn't like when Rawls in the wire, when Rawls was just randomly in the gay bar the one time we never saw him again. What happened to Rawls? I, I don't know. Just thrown out there. Um, well, I had the most problem with Kate because she was my favorite female character. And I, you know, I, I think one of the problems we're going to get to, I, you know, I think both of us had problems with the season finale. So many characters. And even though two and a half hours was a fat amount of time to, to spend with the season finale, it's really hard to be invested with that many people. And these people are trying to get off the island on the plane. Yeah. And it's like, ah, yeah, I'm, I'm caring about 40 people at the same time right now. It wasn't like, oh, my God, I hope they get this plane off because uh, my attention was split 40 ways. And there were multiple versions of some people. Yes. God, what a confusing show. Yeah, I would not want to try to explain this to someone who had not watched it for the last six years. My wife put it on last night. You know, she, she'd given up a long time ago, and it was just like, "All right, honey, I'm going into the basement because I don't want to have to answer seventeen questions." My mom, was, my mom is here because it was her birthday last week, and she's still here. And she watched the Lost. You know, after the Suns game, I zoomed through the Lost, whatever they call it. The, the retrospective. Excuse, the retrospective. Yet another excuse to milk two more hours of commercials that I lost. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, and to, to see it all broken down, how ridiculous the show got over. Like when you just see it kind of condensed in a short time, it's like, oh yeah. my god, what just happened? Yeah, I mean, my, one of my favorites was pretty early on. One of the episodes with Rousseau, she she comes out of the jungle, and and my wife hadn't watched in a while, and she says, "Who is that?" I said, "That's the crazy French lady who lives in the jungle." And my wife says, "Of course, there's a crazy French lady who lives in the jungle." <laughs> and that's just how Ross rolls. So here we so the people who survived. I wrote yeah. it down. Hurley, Sawyer, Kate, and Claire were the four main characters who survived. Then we have yeah. Rosen, Rosen Bernard. Uh-huh. Man, Vincent. Don't forget Vincent. And Vincent the dog. Now, you and I share a similar love for Rosen Bernard. Yeah. Every, every time Rosen and Bernard make their annual appearance, I'm excited. Desmond, Ben and Richard, mm-hmm. the Petus and Miles. Yes. Plus That's it. Anybody the, who wasn't on the island already, like Walt's still alive, Penny's still alive, a couple other people. Right. But I mean, I, out of yeah. the season finale, that's. Now, yeah. my favorite out of all those people is Richard, who <laughs> was born in the 1840s and now has escaped and now is in America and has no identification. <laughs> He's got no passport. He hasn't. The last time he was. Uh, in some sort of a real civilized society was like, what, the 1840s? Well, no, no. We've seen Richard in the real world. Remember, he recruited Juliet to go join the, the biology project or whatever that was supposed to be in Portland. I, I, I'm, I think the others are pretty good about forging documents and stuff. I would not be surprised if Richard winds up on the mainland with like six different identities and a fat bank account and all that. Okay. Because it... Because I was thinking the Richard spinoff, if I could spin off anybody, obviously the first choice would be Sawyer and Miles as cops yeah. in, the, in purgatory. Um, second choice for me would be Richard, guy <laughs> guy 18, from the 1840s who hasn't aged in 160 years, now living in 2010, and and just kind of going down a dark road. Be, you know, Because like, sex is so much more prevalent now and the way women dress. A little bit like when Red got out of Shawshank. I, I was going to say exactly. I wasn't going to go Red. I was going to go the other guy. The oh, Brooks. Man. Yeah, oh, yeah be, Brooks gets out of Shawshank and just can't deal with it. It would be Brooks times a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> and every, every episode climaxes with Richard standing on a table with the noose around his neck and he can't decide. <laughs> <laughs> Ready, I Richard. I can't anymore. I miss my wife. All right, so here are the finale questions we were left with. All right, go. Now that the island is safe, and Hurley is now the caretaker, yeah. and there's no smoke monster, how does he die? Does he just live forever? Uh, he Obviously might, not. He might live forever. He might just live a long time, and then somehow other people get brought to the island. Although, Hurley doesn't strike me as the type who would want to bring other people to this lousy place, so I, I don't know how that would work. Does the island... Does that the island basically turn around like Curly's high cholesterol and, and chance to be predisposed to a heart attack? Well, you know, certainly it cured Rose's cancer, so it could living there for a while without constant danger might be very good for Hurley. Okay, so if you're a Green Bay Packers fan, you might want to move there. Yes. Um, now, if the island, so they they kill Locke, aka the smoke monster. Yeah. Now, if the island, if the island just sank like it was hinted at in the first episode of season six, if the island just sank, would that have necessarily been a bad thing? Uh, 
I, I don't know because they never really explained, you know, what the golden log flume really was. So Jacob said it would be a bad thing. C.J. Craig from the West Wing said it would be a bad thing, but they didn't really say why. Okay, so, so we'll chalk that one up to they try to do so many things with the show that there are some things they just couldn't yeah. believe. Um, season six, the, the 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 afterlife purgatory sideways plot that dominated really the whole season. Yeah. Did we even did we even need it? I liked it as sort of a happy ending for people. I don't know that we needed episode – in retrospect, I don't know that we needed episode after episode of it. You know, we didn't need Kate as a fugitive again. We didn't need some of these other ones um, because a lot of these sort of character tests wound up not amounting to anything. And even this idea that Desmond is wandering around trying to wake people up, that that wound up – the stakes wound up being less dramatic than I think were implied earlier on. And – since he, as you mentioned, was trying to wander around waking people up, why did that lead to him running over Locke with his car? Um, because, you know, sometimes you wake somebody up by introducing them to their one true love, and sometimes you do it by hitting them with a car or beating them in the face, like with Ben. Okay. Um, in Purgatory, yeah. Anna, Lu- Anna Lucia is a crooked cop who takes payouts. Yeah. Is that is that what I'm going to expect in Purgatory if I'm there for a while? Is is people playing out roles like a crooked cop? I don't know. Well, I mean, Anna Lucia was not a good cop, as I recall, you know, from way back in season two. Uh, didn't she kill a guy? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, what struck me is she's sort of a low rent crooked cop. I mean, she only takes a hundred grand to release three prisoners, which I would have asked for at least a million, especially if I knew that the chicken guy, you know, was bankrolling it. Then again, it was Purgatory, so who cares? True. What are you going to do with the money? You can't buy anything. Um, but she doesn't know that. She just thinks she's, <laughs> you know. I mean, that's the other thing. It's like, is everybody in purgatory or is it just a lot of them are fake people there to sort of support the stories of Jack and Desmond and all of them? Well, here, here's my take on that. Yeah. It, it seems like what they were trying to say is that everybody's purgatory is different. So when you're in purgatory, all the people that crossed your life that were part of your destiny, they – are in your purgatory at that specific time in their life. And the reason I say this is because if it was a real purgatory, Aaron wouldn't be a baby. Yeah. Aaron would be a grown up person. So he, but Jack only knew him as a baby. Yeah. So that is why all those people, so he only knew Anna Lucia as the crooked cop who whatever, and that's why she's in. So maybe when you go to purgatory, um, you fulfill Part of being in purgatory is fulfilling different roles for all the different people whose paths you cross. My brain's starting to hurt, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh-oh, I'm, ble- I'm bleeding out of my right course. nostril. <laughs> oh, no. Wait, wait. That means that the island is traveling again, Bill. That's not good. <laughs> it is, it's terrible. Um, here, here's one that really bugged me. Okay. Why Saeed's afterlife, his whole being in, in both his real life and then his sideways alternate life was this Nadia, this unrequited love with Nadia. Yeah. And then his afterlife partner is Shannon, Boone's sister. Yep. I had a major problem with that. They, they had a nice picnic that one time. I, yeah, that, I had an issue with that too. And, the, you know, Jack's dad tries to make the argument that only the people who are on the island together are there. And that's why, you know, Locke's wife isn't there, for instance. But, like, Penny's there. Yeah, Penny, Penny was never on the island, but Desmond gets that Penny with him. So I, I think it may have just been a case of, like, here's who we wanted to have in that final scene. Here's the characters we really liked and, you know, go from there. And even some of the island people don't get to come. You know, Miles isn't there. Daniel doesn't come. Mr. Echo didn't come back, although, we, you know, that's because he didn't want to. Yeah. So. Yeah, but, well, I, I, irrespective to nothing, I hate when they tip away. Yeah. In the credits in the beginning, they say oh, he's going to yeah. be on the show. And it was like, I saw Maggie Grace. Yeah. I'm like, oh. So I you know, I knew she was coming back. I don't think you should tip off that stuff until after the show, if it's, some, yeah, well, the, it's the somebody of that is, caliber. It's a SAG rule. And oh. basically, I mean, they've, they've said this over and over. The Screen Actors Guild makes them put it in front. And you basically have to a- apply for an exemption, and they don't usually grant it. And yeah. I think Battlestar Galactic is the only show that ever really pulled off that kind of thing, where they brought someone back as a surprise and only put them at the end. So. If, they, if they had a sense of humor. Yeah. And it seems like the Lost guys do. This is their biggest, the, the funniest thing they missed, other than that making Kate and Claire f- fall in love with each other. Yeah. Um, Paolo and Nikki should have been in the chapel. And they yeah, just could have been I, shown briefly for like two seconds, but then not. And then it's like they weren't barely there, but just briefly shown. 
briefly shown being ignored. Nobody really liked them, but they were on the plane, so they get to come. Yeah. yeah. Big miss. Big, big miss. This is where I wish they almost had like the lost consulting committee where they could just see everybody would add one idea that they should have included. Um, why did Daniel Faraday have a concert? What what was up with that? Is that why was he playing the piano? Why did we have to go through that? Well, I mean, you know, we saw in his flashbacks that he really wanted to play the piano and his mother pushed him to be a scientist because she knew he had to fulfill his destiny where she would wind up shooting him, um, which is on the scale of lost parenting screw ups. That's pretty high. But okay. he never wanted to be a scientist. So the idea is you go into purgatory and you get to be who you really wanted to be, although that doesn't apply to everybody because I don't know why Kate would still want to be a fugitive. <laughs> I mean, so, it's yeah, so, he, he, the logic is hit and miss. It's so tough when, you know, I don't, the lost guys did the best they could and I would yeah. do the six years over again in a heartbeat. I have no regrets. Yeah. I mostly loved the season finale. It wasn't crazy yeah. about the last 50 minutes, but there were some holes. Um, this, this one, in my opinion, the biggest for purgatory. I, I'm fine with Jack and Juliet, um, maybe being together, but did they have to have the fake son? In the in purgatory of now you, you're creating characters that don't didn't normally exist. Yeah, they had the fake son, and then they basically blow him off to go off to heaven together. So is little David Shepard just wandering around purgatory, feeling abandoned by his parents? Why? But why even have it though? Yeah, well, because they want. I mean, one, I guess they were also trying to show with the purgatory people breaking cycles. You know, Jack finally finds a way to be a better father to a son than his dad was to him. Uh, you know, Locke, Locke makes peace with the fact that he's going to be in the wheelchair and that he's not special, et cetera. Well, then make Walt Jack's son. Make it somebody we know. Yeah. And don't um, explain how Walt's Jack's son. Just do it. That would have been nice to have Walt back. You know, they spent so much time on him at the beginning, and then he wound up not mattering. Well, that, I, I have this written right down now. The three earlier season questions that were never solved. One was, okay. what happened to Walt? Why did the others want him when he was, like, telepathic? And did they? So they just basically abandoned Walt. Yeah, because the kid, the kid grew up too fast, and they weren't ready for it. And then by the time the show jumped forward enough that he, they could bring him back, I guess they didn't care anymore. Yeah. So they just wait. We're wiping Walt out. So if you yeah. ever watch – well, you wouldn't be listening to this if you haven't seen the show yet. But just say you have amnesia or something, and you start and just ignore all the Walt scenes. Yeah. Um, why was there a fertility problem on the island? Uh, I don't know. Lots of lots of different theories I've heard. But, you know, you basically have to invent your own, whether it's the idea that the incident, you know, kind of irradiated the island or even some sort of original sin where when Alice and Janney kills Jacob and the man in black's mom, that triggers some sort of, you know, history repeating itself cycle. But uh, there's certainly no answer in the text. You just have to sort of reach for one with that. And then Eloise Hawking, why was she even on the show? She was Faraday's mom, and she knew things, and she had his notebook. But, um, yeah, I would have liked a little more of her and seeing what happened to her after Daniel died and after sort of the notebook becomes useless. So, but. Did we need the pyramid and Dogen and all those guys? The, the temple definitely seemed a bit of a waste of time to me, especially in the end. I know the guys have argued that, you know, you, you can't just stop introducing characters and mysteries in the end. You need something to move forward. But I, if there wasn't going to be a good enough payoff for it, and I don't think there was, they shouldn't have done it. You and I had the same reaction, not knowing it. Maybe we're connected in a purgatory alternate <laughs> universe. Um, I thought this last night and said it to my wife, and then you wrote it in your thing today. And it was the exact same thing. We both felt like it was a little bit too close to that horrible Robin Williams movie, What yeah. Dreams May Come. Yes. Now, I've never seen What Dreams May Come, and I have no idea what happens in it, but what I always imagined would happen in it and why I never wanted to see it was the last 15 minutes of Lost last night. Yeah, that's, I have not seen it either. I've just seen the trailers, and you know, people today were defending both the movie and the book the movie was based on to me, but um, it's not happening, folks. So. You, you, first of all, you can't defend that movie because it effectively ended Cuba Gooding Jr.'s career <laughs> as, as as somebody who could be put on a poster. It's gone down as one of the four or five worst Robin Williams movies ever, which is saying something because he's made about yeah. 20 bad ones. Yeah. And it was something that we made fun of even as they were showing the trailers before it came out. Yeah. And that loss, basically, that's what happened in Lost. And, and to me, it's like... 
Yeah, I didn't want to tweet anything last night, and I didn't want to tweet anything this morning. I'm still sorting out my opinions, which is one of the reasons we're having this mega podcast. But um, it got a little too sappy for me. And, it, you know, I'm a cyborg. I'm the first one to admit it. I, I'm not the most emotional guy. Um, I'm not somebody that, that cried. The last time I've cried from a movie or a TV show was one time in the last, like, 20 years, and it was Marley and me just because my own dog was dying. So I was the dreams was, didn't do it to you? That was the last time I got choked up, but that was 1989. Okay, but I'm saying, but this is a similar kind of thing to what Field of Dreams did. Yeah, but Field of Dreams was good, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this yeah is I, mean, just... I really liked the finale until that last 15 minutes, so I, I was good with it up until that point. I got to say, like, up until, I don't know, 11.15 or whatever – on on West Coast, it was the same time East Coast time, but the, you know the first two hours, fifteen yeah. minutes, I was feeling really good. Yeah, it's like this is this is killer. This is one of the best yeah. season finales I've ever seen. Man, it just went Robin Williams on us. I felt. Yeah, well, that's they they decided that they wanted to give everybody some kind of happy ending, and the only way to plausibly do it is you know they all go to heaven. I also think the biggest mistake they made this season, um, looking back at everything, is a, is it. A, more than once, and I'm going to say three or four times, the characters in the dialogue almost had to explain, to, you know, verbatim what we had to think was happening instead of doing the old TV thing where you're showing us and I'm coming to my own conclusions. We actually had to have the characters say, well, here's what's happening. In the last case was Jack's dad spelling out with this monologue, oh, well, here's exactly – and that's never a good sign if you're a good TV show, I don't think. Yeah, and, and the weird thing is that, that Cues and Lindelof have said like they didn't want to do that, and they point to that scene at the end of the, the second Matrix movie with the architect where he's explaining everything, and that's kind of what that scene with Jack's dad was. I watch a lot of Scooby-Doo in my house because that's all my kids watch, <laughs> and that's how every Scooby-Doo ends. They, yeah. they, they unmask whoever, and then there's the, you know, Velma explains what happens because everybody else is too stupid, you know. Oh, and then, and then the hotel caretaker, and then he was, and that, you know, but they have to do that because there's two and three and four and five year olds watching. In this case, we're all adults, and I don't know if you need to hold my hand and walk through it, and if you do, then that's not a great sign for how it went. Now, I would do it again. And I'm not, I'm, you know, part of what's great about this show is we can nitpick and ask questions, and I think it's, it's, it's the coolest thing about this show is that it encourages discourse. So I'm not yeah. complaining. On the other hand, I feel like, they just, I don't, they didn't need to go that far. And it seems like you kind of, although you don't want to totally go there yet, you kind of feel the same way deep down. Well, I mean, I think what it was was, you know, up until the, the heaven stuff, I really loved it. But at the same time, it's like it was a great hour of TV and there have been many great episodes of Lost. But, you know, when you have a show with sort of all these mysteries and stories and arcs and stuff and you come to the end of it and like maybe 20% of all that wound up mattering, that's a little frustrating. Like, I, I think there's a lot of incredible individual moments, and like you, I would not trade the last six years for anything, but as a show, I don't think it holds together as much as we were all hoping it would when it started. Is The Wire both the best and the worst thing that ever happened in television? That, it, yeah. It's, it's hard to live up to that. I said in the review, you know, at one point, Jack has that line about, you know, all of this matters, and that's what Lester Freeman used to always say, but on The Wire, it all did. And it yeah. lost it only, you know, a little of it did. Yeah, because I just as they, and you wrote it today and I agree, obviously, yeah. I've said it myself and, you know, others agree that it's the greatest drama of all time. Yeah. And the greatest thing about it was that every scene and character and decision had a purpose. Yep. And tied in together. And, you know, season four obviously was the pinnacle, but season five, even though it wasn't the best, I think it was probably the third or the fourth best of the five seasons. It still was the way it had to end and play out. And, you know, I just feel like it's almost ruined it for, ruined television for me a little bit. Cause yeah, I expect I everyone to be that good. shows as much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, and I expect everybody to be as good as David Simon is with tying every little thing together. And it's just, you can't do it. Yeah, no, that's the, the degree of difficulty on that's ridiculous. Sopranos didn't even do that. I mean, The Wire makes The Sopranos look bad sometimes, and The Sopranos is one of the great shows ever. So. Yeah, and I think as as more time passes with The Sopranos, we're starting to realize that, what did they make, 78 episodes? I think 80. 80, and they probably could have made that show with 40. Yeah. 
there's four, 40 episodes of fluff and stringing along and character arcs that went nowhere and all that stuff. And I don't think Lost was that bad. I actually asked uh, Carlton that when he was on the podcast. Like, I think they did over 120, 120 episodes or something. Like, yeah. how many, if you condensed it to what really mattered, how many? And he said he thought 80. So that's that's a good batting. If you can, 66% of all of your television show actually ties in in some ways to where you want it to go, that's a pretty good batting average. Yeah, I would agree. And I don't mind being strung along either. Yeah, no, and I definitely feel like these last three years after, you know, as he talked about with you, once they set the end date, there was much more of a sense of momentum, and there were, there were less wasted episodes than there had been before. All right. So get some sleep then. We're good. <laughs> Fi- your final grade for the season finale, by the way. Uh, final grade, I would give it uh, a B plus probably, and if we can cut off the the last scene or two in the church, it would go up to at least an A minus, if not an A. Yeah, I'm fine with the B plus, and you could even talk me into the A minus slash B plus. Yeah, and it's uh, it, the grade changes whether we're talking about the episode on its own or whether we're talking about the episode as the end of Lost, because being the end of Lost, that you know, that's sort of a tough job for anybody to have. And again, uh, I would do it again. Yeah, me too, in a heartbeat. And anybody who says that they wouldn't just shouldn't be allowed to watch television. Because you know what? No, no TV show is going to play out perfectly, but um, this is the best acted, um, best written network drama, I think, ever. This it's up here. there. I would, I would have to sit, sit back and think about it for a while, but it's definitely in the top five. For six, for six straight seasons of this, that's I don't think anybody's topped that for yeah. consistency. There was really no season that you could be like, "Wow, throw that season out." That was terrible. You know, I, I never felt like they'd have bad episodes, but just from it's almost like a hitter who went, you know, two for four or one for three every game. Yeah. Alan Sepinwall, HitFix.com. Congrats on your new digs. Thanks, Bill. Talk to you soon. And now let's go to on the line. The biggest lost fan I know, my buddy Gus. What's happening? Biggest lost fan you know? I think you are. Bigger than Kimmel? I don't. I think Kimmel's probably the biggest lost fan you know. No, you are the biggest lost fan I know. I don't do homework after shows like he does. No, he exaggerates that. You're the only person <laughs> I know who, who emailed me last night before the season finale started, saying you were nervous. It was like it was like Game Six of the Finals or something. It was. It was. Well, when you know you're headed towards a, an epic journey and it's all going to come to an end, there's reason to be nervous. You know, the, the the potential for disappointment was probably what I just wanted it to be good. You didn't want to like look back with uh, with shame or chagrin. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, I just talked to Alan Sepinwa, who preceded you on the podcast. Yes. Both of us thought it got a little too Robin Williams bad movie in the last 15 minutes. Now, you're one of my sappiest friends, and you probably loved it, I'm guessing. We have not discussed it yet. No, uh, I thought it, I thought it was very good. Um, I spent a good chunk of the day trying not to read what other people wrote, which is usually just the opposite. I mean, there's so much speculation about every episode and what every single thing means. This one, I think, was you're much better served just saying, what did it mean to me? And I don't really care what it meant to many other people. Uh, that said, I, I read Alan and, and one other thing, and I forget who wrote it, but the point was, if you were invested in the story for the characters, you probably really, really liked it. And if you were invested in the story because you, you liked the science of it and the Dharma Initiative and why Whitmore wanted Desmond to, to survive electromagnetic shock, then you were probably disappointed in it. But most of us are probably somewhere in between. Um, so I liked it. I put it on the level of of, of MASH and, and Cheers from the standpoint that they paid off the characters very well last night. You got a sense of closure with all the characters. I would agree. And you talk about that you're in one camp or the other, and those are the extremists for each side. And right. I think you and I are in the middle. Probably you're more geared toward the characters toward me than than I am. I'm probably like 80, 20 characters versus whatever, how everything was going to tie up. So where were you? Like 80, 20, higher, lower? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I could probably sit down and come up with a list of 50 questions that didn't get answered, but maybe five of them I actually really care. And while they gave you a sense of finalization, they still left it open to interpretation as to what the finale meant or what it was. And as Jimmy said on his show last night, some of it might just be depend on your religious beliefs. Now, I have none. So, you know, I'm not... 
I don't, I'm not a church goer. I don't read the Bible. I don't do all that stuff. So well, the way I interpret it is probably a lot different than, than most people because I would imagine more people have some level of, of faith. So I just took it on face value and was, there were a couple of times where you were one step ahead where you're like, oh, that's going to be Shannon or yeah. before Locke said to, to Jack as they were lowering Desmond, does this feel like anything to you? I was like, Two seconds before that, I was like, oh, this is like when they're in the hatch, but reverse. I liked the fact that I was able to finally be a step of them, ahead of them a little bit. Yeah. You know, that, that part was rewarding. Um, and then when Jack t- opens the coffin and he doesn't see it, I was like, oh, his dad's not dead. Oh, no, wait, he is dead. Oh, wait, they're all, you know, just like those realizations I thought were really cool. Alan and I were just talking about when you knew like it was purgatory. For me, I, I realized it when, um, when they were trying, so when uh, Hurley asked Ben if he was coming in, and Ben said no. Right. And I was like, ah, oh, it's purgatory. Well, it's funny, because I took that to mean more like when when Christian told Jack that these are the, the most profound people in your life or whatever it was, you know, Ben doesn't fit that group. Like, Ben didn't belong in there with Jack. Well, but, but he, neither did Penny. That's that's where it gets. That's where the wheels that's, come off. That's a little where bit. it's a little murky. Yeah, there are a couple of people in there that are like, "Why are they in there?" Yeah, no, that's true. And then someone suggested that that the sideways world was really just an alternate reality that Hurley created as the new Jacob, so that Jack could get to that point. Oh, oh, so you're not a hundred percent on that was definitely purgatory. Not a hundred percent, but again, that's what I think is kind of cool about it because you know, the the line that threw me was when Locke said, "Jack, you don't have a son." Because then you're like, well, wait, so all of this sideways stuff, what, you know, more so than ever, is this an alternate reality? Is it purgatory? It was kind of unclear. I thought all the reunions were very well done. The one that I didn't care for so much was, was Saeed and Shannon because it was really fast. It was like, that was too easy. Yeah. And they spent so much time kind of selling you on as Nadia being Saeed's true love. Yeah. If, if all those reunions were about finding your soulmates, then that one didn't make sense, but... It almost seemed like they couldn't get Nadia. She had some sort of acting <laughs> conflict, so they had to race to get Shannon from right, so so taken too. You're you've been out in Hollywood for a long time now, and you're around these people. And all. Do you watch those shows differently? Because I I'm still it's kind of like me working at ESPN. Sometimes yeah. it's harder for me to get emotionally invested in sports now than I used to because I'm desensitized by where I work. Are you the same way with TV shows? I was when I worked for Jimmy's show, and now I'm now I'm back to where you were. You are. Right. Because being filming bits and stuff and seeing in the editing process and all that, it gets you so in the mindset of, oh, they, they edited it. Oh, they, they. You're, lo- you're looking at it more like you're watching the tricks of it and the cameras and all that stuff. And now I know it's been six years since I worked on that show, so I don't think about that anymore. Now, when uh, you went in, when you went into last night, I thought the week before did a nice job of answering questions and kind of setting us up. For this week, did you have expectations, or did you just kind of sit back and say, "I'm going to see what comes, and then I'll decide at the end if I like it"? No, I was genuinely fired up for it, and I was really excited, most of all, to see where the Desmond thing was going. And I feel like it didn't totally pay off. I feel for the setup that they did for that, I'm not sure it couldn't have all happened anyway. You know what I mean? Right. It's purgatory. You make it seems like you just make your own rules in purgatory. We discussed this with Alan, like, you know, my theory, my theory is that it was purgatory, and that everybody gets their own purgatory, and that that's why, like, Aaron, the baby, is a baby in Jack's purgatory because Jack didn't know Aaron other than when Aaron was a baby. But if it was real purgatory, Aaron would be a grown up at the best point of his life. Like Locke would be a thirty year old with hair and. Everybody would be at their best. They wouldn't be at all the different ways that Jack knew them. It wouldn't be Jack. Well, it depends. I mean, if it's Jack's purgatory, then he gets them all at the time that they were important to him. Yes, that's what I mean. Right. So, but that's but that's what I'm saying is that's why Aaron's still a baby. That's why Kate isn't a night. You know, if Kate, if they actually got off the island and Kate lived to be 95, Jack's not going to see her as a 95 year old woman. Yeah, he but so when Kate has her purgatory. She gets Jack when she knew Jack on the island. Then she gets her mom when her mom was healthy, and she yeah. Her, but she I think you. I think one thing I took away from last night was that was the story of of Jack's life and Jack's purgatory or whatever you want to call it. That that everybody else took a not just a backseat, but they were he was flying the plane and they were in the way back. Couldn't he, agree more. 
you know, and all that other, all the sideways stuff and was, was nice storyline filler. And, but in the end, now here, here's the question that people have been wrestling. I just had a long chat, chat with Josh Elliott, who's a huge fan of the show. He thinks when Jack died at the very end, it was because he never survived the plane crash in the first place. Like oh, he, that was Jay Soderberg, uh, one of our producers. He was just talking about that between phone calls. He thinks they were all dead from the beginning. Which brings up a lot of other questions, starting with then, how was Aaron ever born in the first place? You know, if he dies right then and there, or within the hour of the plane crash, you know, Aaron's never born. Penny isn't, you know, he never meets Desmond. Penny is irrelevant. So, while it's, it's, it might be true, I have a hard time just connecting those dots. It could be true. It's certainly, they, a little bit open. It's almost like the end of The Sopranos, where you, if you really wanted to play up that card, you could. But I feel like the plane crashed. We start. We start out with Jack's right eye. He yep. wakes up. He's in the island, and then we everything that happens is basically what happened to him and his destiny on that island for the rest of the time he was on it. That and was reality. And that was reality, and then right. sideways world was his purgatory. Ah, the bigger question is if that's true. Did we need the sideways world in season six? Did we even need to go there at all? Someone suggested to me that maybe as the new Jacob Hurley created the sideways world uh, so that Jack could get to that point as kind of a payback Mm. for everything Jack did. Interesting. Which I kind of liked. I thought as an episode itself goes, I thought it was a really good episode. I I enjoyed the, the sideways world had a lot of humor in it. Um, and the island world had a lot of tension, and the scenes were fantastic. Yes. My only yeah. dis- my only disappointment was when uh, Locke said, so it's you, I assume you're here to stop me, and Jack said, can't stop you, I'm going to kill you. I was hoping he was going to say, can't stop you, I can only hope to contain you. As a shout-out to Dan Patrick. But... <laughs> or, or I must break you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I thought the acting was, was really, really good, and even Claire was good last night. I know you're yeah. a big fan. <laughs> I'm not a big fan. Uh, I don't think I think she, I thought her and Hurley were the two worst actors in the show. I thought Hurley got a lot better though. I thought his scene Hurley was good last night. night. Yeah, he was, he was good. Overall, though, not not really a strong actor. And Claire, you know, other than uh, some of the people that they had to get rid of as the as the seasons went along, I thought Claire was the worst one who who made it. Now, I mentioned this to Alan earlier. Excuse me about. Uh, I, the, the biggest problem I had was Kate with her destiny. Her de- like I felt like she should have stayed with Jack on the island. If she really loved Jack, stay on the island with him. You for or against that? Y- yes, that makes sense. But that you know that would it's not necessarily her destiny, and, and it was it certainly wasn't her story. You know, that's how so a lot of those issues were resolved for me last night when I just came to realize this was the story of Jack and his journey and his soul trying to get where his soul needed to go. And that it just played out that way. And, and if you looked at the story from, from Kate's perspective, you might see it in a different way. But I like the fact that at least last night she returned to being more of like season one and season two Kate, where she was a little tougher, a little rough around the edges. Yeah. You know, we're not just... Who are you going to miss the most from your life? Just having yeah. them around what, 15 times a year or however many times it shows up. It's funny. I think you and I are in the same camp that I was big on Jack in the beginning and then in the middle of the run, I kind of like, dude, you're bugging me. Yeah. But I, I thought he kind of came back strong this year. I just think Ben and, and Locke are... Two of the more transcendent TV characters there have been in my lifetime. Um, I love Sawyer because, like him, I'm a smart aleck. Um, but I just think Ben and Locke and just their skills were so great. You know, they played two characters every week on opposite ends of the spectrum. I, I think those two guys. I'm going to miss Sawyer the most. And I'm actually going to miss Josh Holloway out of all the actors the most, and I hope that he goes on and does something else. I'd follow Josh Holloway to another show. How many, how many of these would you follow to another show? Well, tell me why you're going to miss Sawyer. 
I just liked him. I thought he was funny. I thought he, he grew the most over the six years he went from. He was kind of irredeemable in the first, first season. Worst character guy on the show and stole supplies from other people and just was out for himself. And, you know, I, I thought by the end, I thought he was, uh, I, I was just on board with him and I liked him. Of the, um, of the reunions last night, which was the one that made it the most dusty in the, Man cave. Oh, I liked, uh, I didn't really get dusty last night. I don't know why. I think it was lack of sleep, but, um, I liked that Sawyer and Juliet reuniting at the candy machine was my favorite. I was psyched that they, uh, they had one more scene together and, uh, I liked, I just, I thought that was good that that arc led them back together. I, I even liked the whole thing that she was married to Jack because that kind of, uh, extended what had happened on the island where she kind of liked Jack and then ended up with Sawyer and that's kind of what happened in Purgatory. But I, I still can't figure out why she and Jack had a fake kid in Purgatory, if it was Purgatory. Right. And uh, that in and of itself wouldn't have triggered some kind of memory. Yeah. yeah but that doesn't mean maybe that they never meant that much to each other in the first place. So there was never that great emotional attachment. I don't know. I thought, um, yeah, I liked that one a lot. And for adults like me who don't sit there and, and try and pick up on every nook and cranny thing in the show, I liked that they did stuff like where she said it worked when he plugged the machine back in. Mm. Um, and that when when Claire was having the baby, they almost like word for word, you know, reinvented the scene when she was having the baby in the woods. Um, just simple stuff for people like me who go, oh, yeah, this is just like that all over again. And peering um, down the hatch was probably the the best callback. Yes. With, I didn't uh, care Jack for, um, you know, obviously I said Shannon Said. Um, I liked the Sun and Jin scene where Sawyer walked into the room and just the look on their face. Of, yeah. You know, that whole kind of like, we know, sometime soon you'll know. It was great. Yeah, that's uh, very well played. I agree. And then the Ben and the Ben and Locke final scene was also fantastic. Yeah. So you would you follow Sawyer to another show? I would. I'd just be kind of curious to have to see what vehicle it was in. You know, I almost would think I'd rather see him in movies than shows. He could. He should be headlining a movie. I'd like to see him, like, he would have been good, like, in Glory Road as the, the coach of the first black basketball team. Like, I want to see him, like, do one of those movies. Make a Disney sports movie, Josh Holloway. We're ready for you with that. Do something. Yeah, he's, he's got different. some kind of a Western feel to him, too. Yeah. You know, he could be in some kind of rough guy cowboy where he still gets to play the, the are you gonna miss Alex. kate you're gonna miss kate um yeah i gotta say i think i like juliet more wow look at you and then the in the uh, ginger marianne argument of our generation <laughs> um i loved kimmel last night by the way when he was when he said to daniel day kim it's like how come every time you're on a boat it blows up <laughs> yeah that was that was very funny He's, you get to follow him on another show. Where is he now? He's going to the Hawaii Five-O remake. Oh, that's right. I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. Um, is- oh, here's a huge question that I have to ask because it, I was, I was, me and a couple of buddies created a little chat room last night, so we were chatting as we were watching the show. I love how you, you try to claim you're not totally into it and yeah. you were in a chat room last night. <laughs> um, <laughs> and one of my friends and I have different cable companies, but at the scene where Desmond and Eloise are talking at the table at the concert, we both had digital hits and couldn't and couldn't hear what they what their conversation was. Did that happen to you? No. Yeah. I got it on West Coast though, so they probably fixed whatever the yeah, issue was. Yeah, but we were not alone. Then I talked to people at work today. A lot of people didn't get that conversation, so you had oh. to like try and figure out what was said there. You heard so, what happened in Cleveland, right? No. The feed went out for a while. Oh no. Yeah. Probably show it again tonight or something, I would imagine. Poor Cleveland. They can't even, even the lost season finale, they lose. <laughs> lost means twice as much in Cleveland, doesn't it? So what's your grade for the season finale? Um, on a emotional level, it was a 9.5. On a technical level, it was probably about a 7.5, just because, you know, there's stuff out there that doesn't connect and there are things That'll probably never make sense, but I just, you know me, I'm, I 
check my consciousness at the door, sit back, and let it wash over me and decide whether I enjoyed it or not. At the same time, you you did delve into the whole internet, and you were reading up. You were you were reading Doc Jensen. Oh yeah, and I spent you know we spent a bunch of time. I, there's four or five people who were on the show that I'm on that we we sat there and talked about, it, and we were espousing theories. Like I was convinced Claire was going to have twins. Uh, you know, in the sideways world to be kind of like Jacob and Man in Black. I love that. That was one of my favorite theories that you came up with. Another one uh, was that, uh, you know, Locke, uh, Jack would be operating on Locke and have his epiphany and have to decide whether to let Locke live or die because that would affect the, the island. You know, so I was, I was big into the speculation, but that was part of what made last night so great was there was no more having to speculate. You got, at least not to a great extent, you got a lot of answers last night. Now, the question that everyone's asking, and, and you as a TV savant, people want to hear is where do you rank it and I, I did some research on that and apparently six feet under has had like the greatest finale ever oh well the, the wire was my favorite ever so the wire wire is one i didn't watch six feet under but i did hear that it was awesome right i still um, have mash very high on the list mash was good even though it had, it, had, it had more than run its course at the time it finally went off the air from the same standpoint as last night, that you got a payoff. There was an end. You understood where everybody was going. There were some great lump-in-the-throat moments and some really good acting. I really like the Cheers one, and I think that one has slipped under the cracks a little bit. That had uh, you know, my favorite thing in that, and I, I love Cheers, and for some reason it hasn't had the legs that Seinfeld has, and it's not on that TBS TNT nonstop run. It's just a little dated, but... I thought that that was one of the best season finale, the most satisfied I remember at the end of a season finale, and I loved when he adjusted Coach's little picture Yep. at the end. That one got me. That was the only time I think I've ever been choked up during any of these season finales. When he right, adjusted. and then he said we're closed when, like, when someone came down the stairs, right? Yeah, it was yeah. just good. It was, and, and the other good thing about the, che- the cheer season finale was – you remember, like all the ep, the, it was like a murderer's row of five straight episodes leading up to it. Yeah, I think Sam slept with Carla in one of them. It was just every episode was great, and Frazier was at the top of his game too. Yep, and Diane uh, came back. Seinfeld for, for me, you know, people were really disappointed by the season finale. I thought that the show in general, the last two, th- once Larry David left, I thought it became a different show, which is very sitcommy and. Um, the, always had to have the four plots that tied in together, and it had kind of lost me a little bit anyway before the season finale. Well, I um, think something similar both to Seinfeld and The Sopranos is while you might have loved the characters and loved the show, I don't necessarily know that you were as emotionally attached to them the way you were for Lost or MASH or, you know, for maybe The Wire. But, like, I loved The Sopranos. I thought it was riveting television. But other than Tony, there wasn't anybody I was like, oh, God, what's going to happen to Paulie? You know, I didn't yeah. I didn't have that emotional connection, in part because they were bad guys. And Seinfeld, it was just, the, you know, the shows were funny, so you don't necessarily get as emotionally attached in, in a comedy as you would a, a drama. So, um, well, you know, it's funny, the 24 season finale, we're taping this on a Monday, the 24 season finale is today, and I was actually out on 24 this year. Right. Just because, you know, it's, they, they should be making movies by now. They, they should have... After five seasons, it should have been over. But I'm going to watch tonight because I love Jack Bauer. Yeah. I like Jack Bauer more than anybody in The Sopranos except for Tony. Tony, to me, he, I, I'd put them on a comparable level for just bringing me enjoyment and liking the character and all that. I guess so The Sopranos, we would agree, is the most unsatisfying or Seinfeld? Well, for me, probably Seinfeld just because I didn't buy into what it was they did. I still... It's funny, I tried to remember, like, what were the great moments from all those series finales, and it's really hard to come up with a, with much of any of them. I think you mentioned that to Carlton Cuse last week. No, like, he said it to me. He was uh, like, right. would name one thing that happened in the Sopranos finale, and yeah. I, I, I couldn't remember one thing. Right, and it's still the case. I wonder five years from now, what will I remember? I think I'll probably, I think I'll remember some, but I also thought I remember a lot from the Sopranos, but some of it, so much gets lost in the argument over what what did the ending mean that you kind of forget, so. No, you, you know what I, I remember? I swear to God, my first memory is thinking my cable box had gone out. Yes. I remember what room I watched it in and what, and my wife and I looking at each other like, oh my God, the cable, how could the cable go out then? Right. Which and then whatever. eventually realizing what had happened. Right. Which was everybody's experience. In some ways, that's different from like lost. It ended last night and there was no ambiguity as towards 
the show was over, but what it actually meant will remain open to interpretation. So I would put Lost, Mash, and Cheers up in my top three. I don't remember Mary Tyler Moore. I know that's an all-time great, but I didn't watch it when it happened. So same same with Newhart. While that was kind of right in my wheelhouse, I just didn't see that finale when it happened. An underrated one that I'm probably the only one who even remembers it was The White Shadow. Which season three was terrible. They brought in the new cast members and it yep. just wasn't a good. But for the final episode, they had the alumni game and they brought everybody back. Yep. And the four characters, Goldstein was in the Marines, I think, and yep. Hayward was working with kids and it was actually a great episode. It redeemed the whole third season. Um, and then that was it for that show. But yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to wrap everything up in a way that you walk away going. That was great. I'm glad it wrapped up that way. I, I just, for me, as I said earlier, it's, a little sappy for me. What do you think is now like the right kind of time period for a show to be successful? Because I was a huge West Wing guy, and yeah. I thought I thought their finale was really good. But they were also, for the better part of the last two years of that show, were working on the next president and that campaign. So you got so removed from the primary characters that when they were paying it off, it was a little empty just because you were really kind of removed from many of them. It's, it's a good it's, question. I would say five seasons, only because The Wire was five seasons, and that had the be- biggest beginning, middle, and end. And also, like, if you look at Cheers, yeah. Cheers was really two shows. It was the Shelley Long show, and then it was the Kirstie Alley show. The Shelley Long show lasted for five years. Then the Kirstie Alley show went from, I think, 80 – it went six years, so it went one year too long. But, right, when they brought you know, in the plumber guy. And that also – that show did a great job of bringing in new characters, which I think a lot of these shows don't do well enough. You know, I think uh you'd think like they brought in um Woody, they brought in Frasier, they brought in Lilith. That was Seinfeld's biggest problem is they, they kept the four together and they never added anybody. It was a lot of peripheral characters, but right. it was those four and it just after a while there's only so many things you can do. Well even Curb Your Enthusiasm at the time after like their fourth year, you're kinda of like, All right, they've kind of done all the jokes they can do, but then they brought in the blacks. Yep. You know, and, and Leon put the show over the top, and it was great again. Yeah, it's true. And they also had the benefit of they could disappear for 18 months. Right. I think it's to succeed on network when you're cranking out 22 shows a year, every year, and, and you have to come back at a specific time. Pretty tough. But, yeah, you, you were a West Wing guy. I wasn't. And that, how long did that one go? Seven? I think seven seasons, yeah. But the story arc was really about, you know, four years. Right, but the last year and a half was very little Martin Sheen and a lot of Jimmy Smith and Alan Alda. And, uh, I just think I think Q said this to you last week too. Is just if they had known going in, we're doing five seasons from start to finish. You know, if you if you take the 120 episodes or whatever it was, you can probably throw out a third of them, and, and it, it'd be great. And if, if they had known from the get go where they were headed with the show. Then maybe a lot more of that stuff, those loose ends that people are having problems with today, would have been either not brought up in the first place or tied together a little bit better, you know. And you're in the same camp I am with. You know what? It was a good six years, and all of us would do it again. So stop bitching about it. You can go nitpick and no, right. should done this, but ultimately it was a it was a good show and it right. was Walt worth watching. Puberty and so he didn't come back. Oh well, you know, yeah. Mr. Mr. Echo didn't want to live in Hawaii anymore, so they killed him. Okay, I get yeah. it. I'm fine with it. Yeah, they never, the fertility on the island, whatever, they never really followed through with it. But, but it, the people it you cared about most, you know, the core group, you got great payoff on all of them. Yeah. Um, last question, how you feeling about the Mets? Uh, <laughs> it tells you all I need to know that last night, the only time I watched that game was uh, during commercial breaks on loss. Um it sucks. It sucks when your baseball season is basically over in May, as we yeah, found out this year. They're going to win just enough to 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 make you go, oh, all right, yeah. And yeah. then yeah, you're going to look up and it's going to be August first. Going to be ten games out. And you're gonna, but you know, Ike Davis is a fun player, and uh, we got um, got a couple other young guys who are interesting to watch. And but yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, baseball season is the hardest one to have to give up on early because. Especially now that I don't have lost. <laughs> that's you, that's your, your, your objective for me and, and for a good portion of America for the next two weeks is to lead us to a new show. I'm going to try. I'm going to start sampling Breaking Bad. We might, we might, have, to, we might have to wait till the fall. Yeah. But I'm going to guess that um, Blue Rookie or Rookie Blue or whatever that is isn't going to be it. 
I'm well, not- I, I really think that the days of the great network dramas are done. Dude, this is the last one. They'll Why? never spend, cause they'll never spend the kind of money that it, it costs to make Lost happen in the first place. There's going to be other great ideas like Lost that people just won't be able to do. Yeah, that was a great part of the pre-show where the actors talked about that and yeah. all that went into making that show. And so it's And the casting, I think, it's so hard to cast those shows that well that it's just you don't have any real screw-ups. And if you do have screw-ups, you can just get rid of them and start over, basically. So oh, yeah, good. or you adjust like they did with Ben. I mean, when he was supposed to be on for three shows, and they said, oh, this guy's good. Yeah. All right. We'll see Thank you. you. On, uh, we'll see your fingerprints on the Morning Sports Center. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Lost. <laughs> it was a good run. <laughs> and thank you. Talk to you soon. All right. See you. Batting cleanup. Although technically batting third, but we'll give him the cleanup spot today. Our old friend, the author, the writer, the rack on tour, Chuck Klosterman. What's happening? Nothing. <laughs> Everything. I, how you feeling? It makes you mad when people complain about Lost. It does. Basically, I have uh, I have three uh, points, and you can talk about every of those points you want or none of them, I guess. First point I would have is that if we're going to talk about this and, and the reaction to this show, we do have to discount the people who have watched this show for two or three seasons in a row without liking it. Their, their opinion doesn't really matter in this discussion because it would be weird to dislike a show over a course of several seasons to then like the finale. It would actually sort of, I would actually feel more betrayed or annoyed if that kind of person would have liked the finale, you know? Yeah. So we really only have to talk about people who were sort of in it to win it or not, whatnot. Okay. Second point I would say is somebody who really did love the show, and I would say is probably certainly my favorite network TV show of all time, or arguably my favorite TV show of all time. I thought that the first 80% of the episode was good. I thought that there was one detail in particular that I found really kind of interesting, you know, as, as a narrative device. But in the end, um, the producers made a strange decision. It, it wasn't ambiguous enough. And it was kind of too clear, and that caused kind of a domino effect with other problems. And the third thing I would say is just in general, the reaction the reaction to this show, and particularly the run-up to this show and the way people sort of responded, does seem to indicate to me a pretty clear problem in society and a way that we are being really negatively affected by mass media. Um, so those are the three thoughts I have. I don't know what you want to talk about, but I can talk about those or anything else. All right, let's, let's hit the last one first. Uh, mass media thing, explain. Well, you know, TV is a form of one-way entertainment, and I think that people have lost a sense of that because we're so inundated now by television and film and all these things that we've been talking about in these podcasts and everywhere else for such a long time, you know, that there's a, something is twisted. You know, it's been twisting slowly over time, but now it's really kind of broke, where people seem to think their relationship with television is uh, symbiotic or, or has a relationship with each other. And it doesn't, you know? And it allows people now, with a, I think, much more often to not only demand things from a medium that they really have no say in, but also to feel as though um, that something was taken from them against their will, that, that it wasn't really their choice to watch this show over time, and if it doesn't satisfy them at the end, they have actually been wronged. I think that's very weird. And I think this, has been, I mean, this isn't the first time that's happened, but I think you can really clearly see it with the reaction to this finale. Yeah, and the other thing, I guess, it's, was this the first show? Why well, The Wire wasn't really big enough. This was the first big show that had a season finale that was much ballyhooed that ended that we had this instant, you could go on tvtattle.com the next morning and there's 25 reviews. And you can cherry pick which ones you want to read and all that. I don't remember that happening. Well, The Sopranos was like that as well. Oh, yeah, you're right. I mean, so it's the, the second one. I mean, the, the real difference here, and this is to a degree to the, a fault of the creators of the show, they did at times, without directly saying it, imply that this was a closed story. Yeah. So that if that if you got that if you're going to sort of deal with some of the 
occasionally kind of befuddling problems that they posed, that there might be a payoff. They never directly said that, but that certainly became the assumption of the audience, and they definitely went with it. They didn't do anything to discount that. When you look at, you know, you look at a show like The Wire, for example, there's not, how, what was the conclusion of The Wire? Nothing has changed. Yeah. And there was no expectation that somehow at the end of The Wire, there would be um, a degree of clarity about everything else we have, we have kind of witnessed. And in this case, they sort of did perpetuate that idea without directly saying it. That's why I feel, to a degree, to a large degree, that uh, the ending was not ambiguous enough. Because what it did then, by saying, okay, these people were dead, and this is what happens when you die, you have to kind of go through all these trials, and everyone recognized it except for Jack, and this is actually Jack's personal story, the vision inside his mind has you know, made this crossover. Well, then you can bring up every other thing in the show that isn't directly tied to his character and really say, well, like, well, what's that supposed to be? Some kind of astral projection that just was to continue. You know, it, 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 it would have been better if it would have been... I mean, I like the idea. I can understand why they would say this whole story is actually one person's experience and the fact that the series began with him waking up and his face and closes with his face. It seems like it sort of, you know, I, it, it feels like you've come to a good conclusion. But uh, I don't know. I think that they kind of played it safe, to be honest. But that said, I'm not, I'm not you know, I, I kind of knew going in that there was no way you can answer all of the questions that they have created over this amount of time. You and I, a lot of times we disagree completely, and that's why we have so much fun talking to each other. This time we were pretty much aligned. We had both come to grips with the fact, for me it happened right around the Saeed episode this season. For you it happened earlier, but you know what? The show isn't going to give me the complete and total <laughs> overriding satisfaction that you know deep down I'm hoping it will, and I'm just going to enjoy the ride from here on in. Now, when, when did you reach that point? Well, I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure I, I agree with, I mean, I, I don't think there was ever a time, there might have been very early on, perhaps through the, at the end of the third season, I guess, when they started the flash forwards, then it started to seem like, well, um, you know, uh, uh, maybe that there's this show's going to move to a different kind of level or something, there's going to be some, you know, that, and that was also when people were, disappointed if people are disappointed by last night's episode and I'm talking about people who like the show and wanted to be you know wanted to be enjoy it I do think that there was this thought that well much like those flash forwards maybe this show will end on something that we could not have anticipated that it's going to be something that that will you know it will it will validate the creator's brilliance because we'll be like I could have never even saw that coming when in fact if you got five or six people around who like this show and are smart, and you would have sat around yesterday afternoon and talked about possible conclusions, one of the people would have said this. Yeah. I mean, the idea of them, the, the idea of them all being dead, you know, they're, they're very, I think it was maybe even in the, I think it was the first or second season, at one point somebody talks about how, you know, a new character is introduced, and they're like, we found your plane, and we sent a robot down there, and there were bodies in the plane, you know. So there was only two available options then. One, which is that the Whitmore character had purchased a plane full of people, killed them all, and sunk it as a diversion. Or that this was them. And that what we were seeing was not, uh, was not tangible. Although, you know, when, when, when Jack is talking to his dad, his dad makes a big point of saying, like, what happened to you was real. You know, the, the, you know these, these relationships you've had and these things that happened were real. They weren't. They weren't a dream, you know, but uh, they kind of have to be if uh, if we're going to accept what was going on. Yeah, I I liked it up until the last fifteen minutes, and I had the same problem we just talked about earlier with uh, another guest that it was too much spelling out in the dialogue, too much of I compared it to the end of Scooby Doo when they. When this Scooby Doo, they tell Velma tells you, well, here's what happened, and this guy dressed up this way. They Lost never did that until this season, and it was almost like they had to spell it out for people. Right, here's well, it what did, you're, it, and I didn't like that. Yeah, I mean, it became a more expository thing. The thing I liked about the episode is I think the idea, I really like the idea of meeting a stranger or seemingly a stranger in your life. Seeing them for whatever reason, you're getting candy bars or whatever, 
and all of a sudden you instantaneously can remember an entire different life. I think that would be, I think, like just that would be the coolest thing to happen. I think to suddenly have your your reality doubled in one sort of flash of recognition. I thought that was a cool idea because I thought it basically kind of uh, was a new way for them. This whole series has been about getting off the island or getting back to the island. How can we get off this island? I thought it was interesting that they found a way to allow people to get off the island without physically changing their place on the planet. Right. Like, you know, like like Sawyer was able to suddenly get off the island by recognizing that that was his past. But um, I, 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 what, are, what are the other people saying? I'm not I'm not reading anything on Twitter or anything on Facebook. I thought it would just annoy me, so I'm not reading anyone's response. I didn't read Twitter. I read a couple reviews today, and um, you know, it was weird. Alan Sepal and I, who we, he came on earlier, we had the same reaction. Was I felt the last 50 minutes were like what that Robin Williams movie, what Dreams May Come or whatever it was called. I never saw that movie, but I imagined that this is what it would have been like. And for me, too sappy. Um, you know, whatever. It, I, I, ne- I went into the show knowing that I was probably going to be a little disappointed in how everything tied together. But ultimately, if, if you like the but characters, if, if you're going you like to the, if, you, if you go into the show expecting to be disappointed, though, it seems like that won't happen, right? Yeah, I mean, not, if, you, if, you, if you anticipate that you're not going to be satisfied, why would you have a twinge of displeasure with the lack of satisfaction? Because what happened during the first two hours and 15 minutes was I was going, oh, this is unbelievable. I was really into it. And, so you uh, sort of you thought that they're really coming to something. Yeah. I just thought it was a great first two hours and uh, really exciting, action-packed. And, and then uh, just to have Jack's dad... This is what happened, son. Blah blah blah. And no, and no, and no. Walk toward the light. It just seemed it didn't really measure up to everything else that had happened, in my opinion. I thought that it would have been. I, I assume that people would have felt differently if, upon the recognition that they were all dead, uh, being dead wouldn't be awesome. You know, because right. they were. They all sort of when they recognized that they, you know, they were dead. It's like you know, like son and Jenner in the hospital, and oh, oh my God, I guess we have this whole other life. We're actually dead now. We can speak English, all that. Then they immediately were like, "This is great," and like Kate can't wait to convince Jack that he's dead. And I suppose because this is like a network television program for millions and millions, thirteen million people or whatever watched it, you know, um, they they sort of wanted people to feel like there was. Uh, it was a kind of an uplifting conclusion, but uh, I don't know. It, it would it would have been. I think that everyone's reaction, even the people who are, if there are people out there who are adamant that they hated this episode, if the exact same sequence had happened, but the final scene had been instead of opening a door of light, if they would have opened a door of pitch blackness that they had to go into now, I think there's a lot of people, a lot of critics who would have liked that more. Even though the uh, the reality wouldn't be any different, or or the ability to sort of prove or answer these questions wouldn't be any more resolved. But isn't it funny though that the same people who probably complained that The Sopranos was too ambiguous then complained that this wasn't ambiguous enough? Well, <laughs> so like you the, can't win. The thing about the end of The Sopranos is is that people responded to that, as you said earlier, almost five minutes after it happened. I mean, I remember my my wife went to the internet right after it finished and there were already people who of course were responding for the most part negatively they were responding with the idea that they didn't get it but if you're going to put all these hours into a program and i think that what lost was like 140 hours or something i don't know how many hours the sopranos would have been it seems pretty idiotic to come to a conclusion about something's finality an hour after it happened I mean, you're not going to think about, you're going to invest all this time in the watching, and you're going to spend 20 minutes into the thinking about it. That, that seems nuts to me. So over time, I think now the perception of the Sopranos final has become much more positive than it did in that first week. Over just, time, I don't know if that will happen with Lost, because as I said, at least with the Sopranos, it was very jarring, and there seemed to be a lack of clarity. They tried to make things clear with this, and it had never been the aesthetic of the show. Like, why, either there was never a point in the run of Lost where it seemed clear what was happening. Why was there this necessity to make us feel that way at the end? 
Be, I think, as you pointed out earlier, it's partly because the creators kind of insinuated that everything was going to tie together. So they raised the expectations a little artificially. I am I like to live in a world where the creators don't I, – like I thought – this is my favorite thing about The Sopranos and The Wire to a lesser degree. That guy was a little more open but not really until the tail end. But I like – I like not no. I like not being let behind the curtain. You know what? Let me stay on this side of the curtain. You stay on that side. Don't tell me how well, the how you're killing the cows. Just give me the steak, basically. I suppose that from the creator's perspective, that they're like, well, there's still lots of things that are unanswered. There's, but the core question is because the you know there are all these questions. What do the numbers mean? How does the smoke monster exist? But there was only really one important question, which is why is this happening? Yep. That was the whole thing. Why is this happening? Why, because of after this plane crash, all these insane things are happening to these people who suddenly went from a tangible world to a supernatural world. We're traveling through time, all these, but why is it happening to them? And that was sort of the one, one of the things that they just, that they, that they answered without sort of, um, you know, Jack needed, apparently, according to the show, to meet these people to have this experience in order to move into the afterlife. So he had to meet people he had never met before. Why weren't the people currently in his life able to do this? Why did he have to know, you know, like uh, an obese lottery winner in order to better understand who he is as a person? I, I mean, I, I know now it sounds like I'm the kind of person who's, like, nitpicking, but I do feel the core question of why is this happening was the one thing... That if the uh, if if the creators were going to try to answer, they really had to do it in totality. You know? Yeah, it would have well, been better to never describe. It would have been interesting to me if we would never know why this happened. You just basically elaborated that because there are some people out there who are still espousing the theory that everyone died when the plane crashed in the first episode. And yeah. that everything else happened was whatever purgatory, and then this was an alternate purgatory to the purgatory, but. I, as you said, he wouldn't have known all of these characters. And if you're seeing it through Jack's eyes in Purgatory, how would he have known anything about any of these other people? He wouldn't have. So. I sense you're almost worn out by thinking of this, Bill. You just don't seem to have that same sort of juice in your voice. <laughs> I, 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 have you just talked about this to a point where you really don't care anymore? No, 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 not at all. I, I said, I told Alan earlier, I was thinking about it last night and trying to figure out the time con- continuum and all that stuff. And, it actually made my head hurt and I had to stop. Like I thought like something was happening in my brain. Like it was – because when you really – you could really delve into this to a point where it, it's almost not worth it psychologically. You know what I mean? And that's why I never delved into the whole message board, website, all that stuff. Last night I didn't even read Twitter to see the instant reactions from people. And, um, well, I mean that's like what the part of the thing I was saying with, with, what I do think is sort of problematic about this. Well, we're, the reason lost – is so interesting to people who aren't even watching the show. There are people listening to this podcast who probably have only seen a handful of episodes. But what became interesting to that casual person is that the existence and the experience of this show went outside of the show. It went into all this sort of uh, uh, kind of kind of into this internet world, into the board game world, into all these. You know. And uh, the thing is, shows need to be enclosed. They need we need to see them only as TV shows. So, I mean, as a television show, I mean, if you just, if you don't think about it in any way except for the things that we actually saw on the program itself, it's basically just the highest end of escapist television. Yeah. And that it's, that, that for the most part, you know, we, we never know who we're supposed to follow, who's the good guy, or who's the bad guy. That question went on really to, you know, until to, to the very end. Um, there was a degree of action, but not a lot of action, just enough to keep people interested. There were, it was character driven, but the characters were kind of, um, flat in a lot of ways. Uh, but the thing is, you could very easily get into this world and, you know, and it wasn't escapist, um, the way, uh, you know, like, I don't know, like Sex in the City or Entourage or any of these shows are where you just sort of don't have to think. This was escapist programming you could think during. And I think that's why it was so successful to me. I don't know why, why other people liked it. I'm not sure. I never know why people like things. I liked it because it was incredibly acted, like compared to what else I see on network television. I thought it was well written, and I felt like uh, they weren't talking out of their ass with the show, so to speak. Like they actually did have a semblance of a plan, and maybe they didn't fully realize what it, what it was until the third season. But 
Were um, you uh, Were you watching the Suns game simultaneously while you watched Lost? No, it was beautiful. I had uh, I'm West Coast, so that game was over by the time Lost. Oh, was there. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I suppose that's true. Yet another I'm, benefit of the West Coast. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw that you you on you uh you had said like this is a series now or something. But it is. I'll tell you what, man. It seems like the Lakers can get it can get any shot they want whenever they want it. If they, they want to they, dump it down, if they want to dump it down low, they can. If they want an uncontested jump shot, they can. If they, you know, if they, get, Stoudemire was right when he said that Odom had a lucky game. He was lucky to be playing the Suns. <laughs> I mean, they they give them anything. That, I can't. I mean, I was. I'm rooting for Phoenix to win the whole. The whole. I want them to win the championship, but yeah. I just don't see. Um, I mean, the Lakers shot like what 58 percent that first game. And they scored 65 points in the first half of the second game. I mean, that's not any reflection on how awesome they are. Every shot, they, they get exactly what, what they want on every possession. So yeah, but was what last changed, night, though? Was last night's game different? Yes, because they made them shoot threes. And they basically said, we know you can beat us conventionally. So, here, beat us by having Derek Fisher and Ron Artest and, Lam- and Lamar Odom shoot wide open 25-footers. Because we're not giving you anything else. So they and just, that was it. I mean, were they, did they play zone? Yeah, they played a zone the whole game. Yeah. Well, I mean, it'll be, I mean, I hope, I hope they win game four. It's just that those first two games, it just, it, it didn't, it almost seemed, I wouldn't say unfair, but a much greater mismatch than I had anticipated. They had a and fundamental so, problem though. They, they, they couldn't figure out how to play Lopez and Stoudemire at the same time. Because one of those two would have to guard Amari, I, I'm sorry, uh, Lamar Odom, who mm-hmm. was just torching him. So it's like, all right, what do we do? Oh, let's go to the zone. Now we have these guys in the court together at the same time. They can't really find a defensive hole, and they're going to have to jack up threes. Now the next game, Ron Artest and Fisher could combine to go 10 for 17 from three, and they're going to lose. But well, at least yeah, they're letting those guys decide the game and not Gasol and Kobe. It just seemed to me like that they were they had lost all the advantages they had. Like, obviously they have an advantage of point guard, but not really if Fisher has wide open jumpers and he's effective. They obviously have an advantage. Stoudemire is better than Bynum, but not if Bynum's getting the ball four feet from the basket, taking one dribble and dunking. Then all of these strengths you have are basically completely nullified. And the weaknesses against Kobe and against Gasol are then kind of, uh, you know, pretty much open wounds. They had to figure out a way to beat that lineup with Gasol, Odom, Artest, Kobe, and Fisher. Because that lineup was just killing them. And they, they had no counter to the lineup because if they went small, Odom could do whatever he wanted. And so now it seems like they've at least put it in a position where the Lakers are going to have to play really well to win game four. So, okay, so do, you, do you now actively think Boston's going to win the title? Like, are you already, are you in your mind, have you made the commitment now that you're expecting, this is kind of like Lost in a way. Now, you <laughs> said that when you were watching Lost, you were trying to sort of keep um, the degree to which you were going to be excited or kind of all emotionally in to a minimum. Have you made that jump yet with the Celtics, who seem to me right now clearly playing the best basketball in the country? It's like Lost. I've stopped trying to figure it out, and I'm just along for the ride. <laughs> it makes my I mean, head hurt if I try to figure out how Kevin Garnett, all the, who limped around all season, is all of a sudden moving around like it's 2008 again, and how Rondo, who is this polarizing guy in the team that the veterans resented and they wouldn't just admit that it was his team, they all have now admitted it's his team and he's playing out of his mind. I never saw any be, of this. Will coming. you be Will you be disappointed now if they don't win the title, or will you think they still? Because you know you had really sort of. They deserved it. At the end of the year, yeah. They were done. Well, they, I don't, 27 I mean, and 27 but, but in the last couple of four games. Apparently they didn't deserve it, though. Apparently that was the smartest thing they could have done. Well, it's there's it's only happened two other times in the history of the NBA that somebody has tanked the end of the regular season mm-hmm. to that degree and then actually turned it around in the playoffs. Like It's just not a but past common performance thing. performance does not dictate future returns. Usually it does, though. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, like your whole thing with Rashid, right? You know, uh, Rashid did was a dog all year, right? And he's never going to start rebounding. He's never going to start playing defense. But he might start knocking down shots. And if, 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 when they put him and Garnett on the floor at the same time and they got these big dudes 20 feet from the basket, Rondo just kills people in the middle of the floor. I can't see anyone beating them if Wallace and Garnett are making jump shots because Rondo is the best player right now until the end, and Kobe is. I can't check. Well, what, you're going to have to come back on to discuss this. Uh, okay. We have, two, we have two minutes left to Lost, and I have to ask you this question. Okay. 
Was the wire so good that it ruined all future shows? No. Because, because no, after how the was, wire wrapped up from beginning to end and was just, was able to tie every nook and cranny together. I mean, every time I mean, a show can't do that, now we blame the show. The wire was great. I mean, but the wire also had the element that it sort of had, had this political side to it where it sort of made, I think, a lot of people who, a lot of rich white people suddenly felt like they could understand urban crime and urban problems because the show felt at times like a documentary. And I got to admit, every season I watched it, I watched it like it was a documentary until the very last season when they introduced the journalism subplot and I saw what a caricature of a newspaper they were creating, which made me realize that's probably how it is for the drug dealers. That's probably how it is for the cops. This thing that seemed so real to me because I didn't have any sense of what that world was like I mean, that's what seems so good about it. It seemed real, but it wasn't. Yeah. Wow. So, and, you're, so season five ruined it for you a little bit. Oh no! I mean, I still. If you, if you ask me, shows that I, you know, top five shows of all time, The Wire's definitely in there. The writing was great. It was the best writing of any show I've seen. But what I'm saying is that part of the thing that made it so good was this emotional and mental component that made it seem like. You were understanding a, a, a kind of politics that isn't necessarily present uh, in the mainstream. This is sort of the reality of what the world, of what that world is really like. And I believed it completely until I saw the one element of society that I did understand. And then I saw how that was fake. So if that's fake, why are the other things still real? I mean, it seems like an obvious thing to say. I was, it was kind of my fault for maybe embracing and adopting my belief in that program too much. Hmm. They probably drug dealers don't talk that way. I, I wanted to think that they did. They probably don't any more than journalists don't sit around going, can you believe they put that story below the fold? For you? It's like, that's, that's like a cartoon of a newspaper, you know? <laughs> that's a good way to end it. Uh, so ultimately, grade for the season finale? I know you hate giving grades, but give one. Oh, for the episode itself, uh, B minus or B. And I mean, I'm a little, I, I, I just, it could have been better. They could, they had, they had the opportunity to do something better and they chose not to. And I, and that, you know, but hey, it's not my show. It's their, it's their call. I just watch it. Will we ever see, because network TV is changing so much now and they're never going to spend this much money on a pile and all that stuff. Do you think another network drama can, Get this much attention and be this much polarized, be this polarizing and all that stuff. Will this happen again? Totally. Okay. Absolutely. So I mean, I think, sure. you know, yeah, I, I you know, it, it, people won't pour money into it, but they'll find other ways. I mean, the thing is, television is getting better. There's still no question about it. The last 10 or 15 years of television have been the best 10 or 15 years we've ever had of TV. The fact that we even had, that people talk about these shows the way in the 70s they would have talked about Woody Allen films or like, uh, you know, uh, you know, new records by, you know, Zeppelin or whatever, like that, that, there, that this, there's this kind of intellectual community who's just interested in TV indicates to me that it's just going to more, it's just going to get, I think it's going to get better and better. I, I don't see why it would. Yeah. I hope you're right. All right. You have to come back on another time and we can argue about all the other stuff we usually argue about. Chuck Kosterman, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.